Hello everyone and welcome back to another Planetarium show. My name is Jessica, I'm the director of the Planetarium and with me tonight is one of our students who I will let introduce himself and say hi. Hi, I'm Luis. Uh, I'm a chemical engineering student here at the U uh, at UM at UMD working here at the Planetarium. It's we're we're already on vacation yeah. brain since fall break has just oh. started. So <laughs> yep, I've I started about five hours ago. So <laughs> ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so tonight is the very last of our Spooktober shows, which is a little bittersweet, I will say. I'm, I'm sad that it's over, but I'm really excited for, for our last show here. Um, so if you were with us last week, you saw our um, Harry Potter show looking at how a lot of the names of the characters um, are related to different astronomical objects. Well, tonight's show is a continuation of this, but looking at the creatures in the Harry Potter series. Um, so I don't want to give too much away. Um, before I completely turn it over to Louise, as always, if you have any questions throughout the show, feel free to leave them down in the comments. I'll be keeping an eye on those and we'll let Louise know if questions come up. We'll also have time at the end to take questions. Uh, so with that, Louise, it is all yours. Perfect. Thank you, Jessica. So we're going to... Oh, I, I did a... not give you permission, yeah. did I? Okay, no, here we go. You're good. <laughs> Yeah, let's try this again. Um, here we go. So yes, as Jessica said, this is our second show for the Harry Potter astronomy kind of series we have, we've started here in the last two years. So this one's going to be uh, looking at the at mythical beasts within the Harry Potter um, franchise that are also different things in the sky, which is very cool. I got to look at some very beautiful like photographs and different things like that. So I'm excited to share. Um, so can continue on here. There we go. So our first mythical beast that we're going to be looking at are dragons. So as some of you Harry Potter fans know, dragons are a big part, kind of mysterious in the background, but a big part in certain books. First, we have the we have little Nor Nor Norberta in the first book that Hagrid sadly gives away information to get a dragon's egg. Then we have the return of the dragons for the fourth and seventh books, where they're kind of just more of a large, ferocious beast. And so just this cute little dragon youngling that we, that we knew of. And so we have two separate things that are connected to dragons here in the sky. Our first is going to be Draco the dragon, which is going to be a long serpent-like dragon we have in the sky. Uh, this one is going to be in the northern hemisphere that kind of slithers right between Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, as you can see in the photo, kind of weaving through. Um, so a cool thing is that one of the stars, I can't remember what name, but one of the stars in Draco is actually one of the northern stars either within one of the 13 million years, I believe. So it's and the so, star is Thuban. Thuban. And Thank it's you. the third star from the tip of Draco's tail. And that was the North yeah. Star when the ancient Egyptians were around, which is why all of their um, architecture uh, no longer has matches the alignment of the stars because their North Star was different than ours. Mm -hmm. So that's a really cool fact because, I mean, for us, the Polaris has been the Northern Star for ever as far as like the last century or so. So it's really cool to know that there was a different star at that time. At the same time, there were civilizations back then that had uh, buildings and uh, certain ceremonies that um, would amass around these days uh, according to their sky. Um, the second photo we have here is gonna be the Dragonhead Nebula, which is a really beautiful photograph here. It's going to be, sadly, it's in the southern sky, so we don't get to see it as often if we point a telescope at it. It's going to be part of the Dorado Nebula, or Dorado Constellation. Um, another name that it goes by is going to be NGS 2035. And so uh, a nebula, if you aren't uh, familiar with it, a nebula is basically just a big cluster of gas and dust in space that starts to, it, it comes from 
a supernova at the end of a star's life and then starts the process over again to start the formation of new stars and new uh, bodies in the sky. Our next uh, mythical creature that we're going to be looking at is going to be centaurs. So centaurs are a big part of the books as well. They're um, in the first book when Harry uh, fall. I, I don't know if I should be giving like spoilers if someone does, hasn't read the books. I'll be honest. I I'm just gonna okay. keep, <laughs> I'll keep going. They're, they're out. Um, uh, so they're part of the first book when Harry meets Voldemort for the first time in the woods. He doesn't know it's Voldemort, but a centaur comes and saves him. Oh, I used to know the centaur's name. I, I'm a big Harry Potter fan. I'm a nerd about it, but I totally forgot the centaur's name that saved him. But a big part of centaurs in the Harry Potter centaur? universe is... I, I can't remember still. I'm going to have to Google it because I want to know. Yeah. I know there's two of them, too. There's two of them that show up. Um, so, again, uh, centaurs are big uh, are in the Harry Potter universe, are big into the sky, into the constellations, into the movements of planets. So they're very philosophical in the way that they get most of their information or kind of how they go about living through the stars. They're very connected to how things in space move and how they perceive everything else and other creatures in the world basically and so we have here the Centaurus constellation so you can kind of see by this uh, photo that you can pick out a little head area up here some arms going out between the stars a body of a horse and then some horse legs front and back and so um, Centaurus is in the southern sky. And so here we have about, I think, 15 stars. And it kind of varies between uh, what people recognize as part of the constellation and what's part, not part of the constellation. So it can vary between 15 to 11 stars, how to, depending on how you make the centaur. And so, as I said, this is in the southern sky. We don't get to see it too often. Um, some cool things is some recognizable stars that are within this constellational field or constellation field is there's uh, Alpha Centauri and, B, uh, and Centauri B, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jessica. It's just what I found. Yeah, so um, mm -hmm. Alpha Centauri is a multi-star system with Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So Proxima and Centauri is, yeah, as Jessica said, the closest star to us, which is of significance because a lot of the things out that we see are hundreds of light years away. Um, some of them almost hundreds of thousands of light years away, which is a very big distance. So it's kind of cool to know your neighbor, obviously. Um, and so I, it's not part of the constellation, but Alpha or Proxima Centauri is kind of just what they call it since it's within like the area that the constellation was found. And so the sky is basically broken up into 88 different constellations. And depending on what's found in those like areas, like the jigsaw pieces, it depends on what the stars or different things get named after in those areas. And so we can continue on to the Phoenix, which is a very beautiful majestic bird. We have Fox, which is uh, Dumbledore's phoenix. And so there's some pretty great things around it. He's basically featured in every single book and movie as some sort of little thing that is put in kind of just like a little antidote, uh, just a little sprinkle of this is what the phoenix is up to. And so a uh, marvelous thing is that there's also a constellation called the Phoenix constellation, which is based in the Southern sky. And as we see here, there are two different kind of drawings of it. The one on the left looks more like a Phoenix in my opinion, basically. But the one on the right is the official constellation on where 
people have agreed on these are going to be the stars that make up the constellation. And so there are four main stars, and you can see them uh, scribed in the Greek set here, alpha, beta, and so on. And so um, this is a constellation found in the Southern Hemisphere. And I like the one on the left a lot more just because it kind of shows like the phoenix rising position where it, it dies and then from the ashes that it explodes into, a baby phoenix comes from. And then eventually, uh, once it matures enough, it uh, the phoenix tends to rise up. And so that one's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, apparently it's not the official constellation. Um, another thing that you can uh, look and see is we have other constellations around the main Phoenix constellation that in this area of the sky there are a lot of different bird constellations or the yeah a lot of different birds con bird constellations so here uh, in the bottom right corner we see Grus which is the crane constellation and we can't really see it because the photo has been cut off to just show the the Phoenix constellation, but there's a crane in this area. And then right above, there's this uh, another section, another line for a different constellation. And that is going to be the Tucana constellation, or the which is related to a Toucan constellation, basically. And so there's just there's a little area of the sky that has like just a ton of little sprinkled uh, bird constellations, which I think is kind of cool. I grew up being a big kind of bird watcher, bird identifier kind of person. So it's kind of funny that they're all in one area and it makes it easy. <laughs> the next uh, few constellations that we're gonna be looking at are gonna be a snake constellation. And so here we have two different snakes that come from uh, the, the Harry Potter universe. On the left side, we have a basilisk, which as we know in the second book, it, the basilisk kind of, or the whole book kind of revolves around the big basilisk and the beast of Salazar Slytherin. And so we have that example, but then we also have Nagini on the other, on the, in the other photo, which is Voldemort's uh, helper. And it's just very weird that we have a ton of other creatures that are like either neutral or good creatures while snakes have been purely demonstrated in the books as something like on the other on the bad side or on the dark side that always tries to end or always tries to kill harry or except for the just... very first one the one at the zoo <gasps> you're right the bow constrictor from Brazil. he was nice he was nice yeah my bad. I misspoke there. I'm completely yeah, wrong. How about all snakes <laughs> within the magical community? Yeah. Because that okay. was more of a muggle snake, right? Mm -hmm. Muggle world That's snake. true. That's true. So, yeah. <laughs> In the view of the wizard society, they tend to be evil in some sense. And um, another great, another thing that can be contributed to, or connected through snakes is that uh, both Harry, Voldemort, and Salazar Slytherin were parcel tongue speakers, which means they could talk to snakes. And oh, I just thought about another snake. There's that snake that Draco um, basically enchants into when in the duel club in the second Right. That's another... And everyone thinks he's sticking it. And yeah, 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 that's right. Uh -huh. Yeah, that, that's another snake reference in the second book too i guess the second book is just a big snake book oh. <laughs> um and so <laughs> moving to the constellations here we have um the constellation area in the northern hemisphere which is between ooh, yeah boates or yeah boates and hercules which are kind of show up towards the end of the night toward um towards the left side of the, or early in the night towards the left side of the Big Dipper. If you follow the arc, you can follow through to find Boates and finding the Serpens constellation. And so the Serpens constellation is kind of split into two separate things. We have the Kaput side on the left, which is toward, or with, which has the uh, beginning and the head area, and then the Kauda, which is the tail end. 
and we have oh oh I'm, I wrote this down Ophiuchus yes Ophiuchus here in the middle <laughs> in the middle which is also oh he is the constellation that kind of has like a brutal thing that happens to him basically yeah uh, got... we we tell a pg version of it mm -hmm. in our uh spooky star stories show that we did um i think two weeks ago so if you want to hear the story of Ophiuchus, you can go watch that um it should be in our uh video section of our facebook page or on our youtube channel perfect um but in a different story that also uh has the same stars there is a healer instead of Ophiuchus. And this healer has two snakes instead of just the one snake. And as the healer uh, has this dying snake, and at the same time, feed, or a different snake comes up and feeds this a dying snake some sort of herb, and then it comes back to life. And so now this healer has two different snakes that it's helped out kind of working the magical herb that the second snake brought in. And so we can uh, see both either one big snake that kind of just Ophiuchus is holding, or we have two different snakes that the healer is holding. The next slide, we have our winged horses. So the winged horses in Harry Potter show up every once in a while, um, either in the fourth or fifth books usually, where on in the fifth book, we have the uh, Thestrals, which are kind of like the dead looking horses that eat meat and everything and that live in the woods. Um, I think the baby Thestral in the movie was like the cutest thing when it's like trying to eat the meat and just totally rejects the apple that Hermione gives it. Like that's just so cute. And even if they're like bad omens, they're just, it's an animal, they're cute. Um, and then in the fourth books, we have here the Abraxan which uh, are a breed, a special breed of fine horses that help pull the, oh, I am blanking on how to pronounce that name. The, the, uh, Bo yeah, the Madame. Yeah, Madame Maximis of uh, uh, school. I can see it in my head and I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> um, and so, uh, the Braxton help carry the carriage for the school. Um, some cool things about a Braxton is that uh, they can actually be a Patronus. They're a very, form of, a rare, very rare form of Patronus that some people can have. And uh, that's just really cool to have a fine horse as a Patronus, I think. Um, so we have our usual friend, Pegasus, as a constellation that we can... Uh, connect the flying horses to in the sky and so depending on in, in this photo we could have what 10 different stars that make up the pegasus constellation most of the time we like to just point out the four the four stars in that boxy area of pegasus and so this is where we kind of make fun of the, <laughs> the greeks hundreds of years ago or yeah thousands of years ago and say they just looked up and saw a box and said oh that's definitely a flying horse let's call it pegasus and I, so, I always just joke that other people added on those extra stars on the edge just to try and make it make sense just to make it make sense but no no i love it it's just a big box it's... in the sky and that's that's a horse with wings mm -hmm. <laughs> yep and so um, we hit, we tell a story at the planetarium that uh, Pegasus is accompanied by, or is the companion of Perseus. And if you know the tale of uh, Andromeda, you know Perse Perseus and Pegasus come and save her. And so there's just a very, the good guy kind of feeling where the horses in Harry Potter were kind of like a neutral being at the same time, they were very helpful, very kind. Um, and so I don't think this constellation really does it justice as being a flying horse, in my opinion. I mean, it could be a horse, but there's no like wingy stars. Um, continuing on, we can look to the 
owls. And so owls are a big part of a lot of Harry Potter fan, um, fans and a lot of just Harry Potter books and universe where they're just everywhere. In the first book, hundreds of owls show up to Harry's house with letters when Uncle Vernon doesn't want to give Harry a letter. They're just so persistent. They're seen throughout um, the books, the movies. They're just everywhere when you need them. They're basically a wizard's best friend in a way. It, instead of dogs being a man's best friend, they're a wizard's best friend. And so we have some very cool things to show about owls in the sky now. So we have both have a constellation and a nebula. Uh, on the left, we have Noctua, which is the owl constellation found in the southern skies. It's going to be at the very tail end of Hydra. So Hydra is just this big, long line of stars that fall, um, sorry, that fall through the sky, kind of in like a U, W shape. And so at the very end, we have Noctua, which is kind of just sitting on the tail end. And there, as you can see again, there's more birds sitting on Hydra, where off to the right top corner, you can see Corvus, I believe, which is a crow constellation or a raven constellation, depending on who you ask. And so it's just another thing of like people like putting birds together in the sky for some reason. On the right photo, we have an, another nebula. And so this is either considered the owl or the owl eye nebula. And it's kind of just like a cool greenish color circular nebula that's actually, if you have a good enough telescope, you can find in the northern sky because this one is located right on the belly or right under like the belly of um, Ursa Major. And so if you do the whole Ursa Major, you can see between the two legs there's, or underneath the cup of the Big Dipper, um, there's just like a little area. And if you point a telescope, a strong enough telescope towards that area, you can actually see this nebula that comes, I, I don't know how easy it is to come into view, but yeah. And so this one is found right underneath the, the big bear and is also referred to as M95 or 97. Wow, I'm just, yeah. <laughs> so the next magical creature we're gonna be looking at are spiders. And so for this one, I was really debating if I should put a massive spider on the screen. Mostly because, I mean, like Ron, people actually do have arachnophobia and don't like seeing spiders. Uh, so, I would be one of them. I am not yep. looking at my screen right now. Yep. And I, I just decided to do it because this was such a cool photo of Aragog. Um, and so the next, or with spiders, they're a big part of the second book and the seventh book, depending on if you read the books. Oh, and I guess in the movie. But Aragog is just Hagrid's best friend since his time at uh, Hogwarts. And so it's just very cool. To, there's also a nebula that references spiders. And so this is the spider net or the red spider nebula. Yeah, I spoke. And so it's going to be found in the northern sky near the Sagittarius constellation. So this is, again, a very beautiful photo taken by Hubble of basically the aftermath of a star exploding. And not all stars explode in the same way in the same shape and everything. And that's how we get these beautiful or different varieties in explosions and photos that we get to see. And so that's very cool. This one in the end turns out to explode into like a spider shape in a red kind of um, oh, black widow kind of shape to it. And so this one is also referred to as NGC 6737, 6537, so sorry. And so that's very cool. Um, and then finally, our next animal, mythical beast, is going to be the giant squid. Even if this isn't really a mythical beast, it's still something connected to the books, where in the, in the lake there lives a giant squid. It sometimes comes and plays with kids during spring break. Towards the fall, it starts to go underneath and hibernates in the winter or in the in the lake. And so 
something very cool where they don't really show it in the movies at all but if you read the books you always think like oh yeah there's just a giant squid in the lake at all times and it's very it's a very cool thing to remember and just it's cool to have a pet squid to hang around with um so our final nebula that our final yeah nebula we're going to be showing is going to be the squid nebula so this one is as you first the squid nebula is going to be the blue nebula there in the middle and so it kind of just looks like a big squid i guess um something you may notice about this photo is that there's a big cloak of red around it at the same time so this is actually two separate nebulas that are within like the same area of space and so first or the red one is called the uh, the bat nebula and so this can be found in the northern skies near cepheus or this nebula system can be found in the northern sky near cepheus and so this basically they're two different uh nebulas that were created at different times in the same area and it's just really cool to see that this happened because again not every nebula is the same there's different varieties there's different uh, environments, different occasions that happen when nebulas are created after a supernova. And so this is just is also a great example of there can be two different ones at the same in the same area and create two uh, distinct nebulas that are both very pretty. So that's going to be the end of the show. On this end, I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. You had to go and yeah. hug a giant spider. I know. I've I was <laughs> debating uh, if I should put it on, and I just ended up doing it. <laughs> no, but I mean, it is a big part of, especially the second book mm -hmm. and and movie. Like, it's spiders play a major role. So yeah. I just don't watch those scenes. Nope, I don't play me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, that was really cool. Um, I'm not seeing any comments at the, or questions at the moment, uh, but if anyone does have questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments. Um, so we asked everyone um, before we started what their favorite mythical creature is, uh, and I haven't gotten any responses, so maybe we'll go first and some people will, will put theirs in if we share. So what do you think? What's your favorite? That's hard. It is, I right? Definitely, I like the dragons. And then I also like the uh, Thestrals, but also just the baby Thestral. And See, the baby, I'm, really I'm like torn between dragons and Phoenix. Phoenixes are also very cool, yeah. Which are probably the more popular answers. Yeah. But I just really, I've always really liked the Phoenix. I love it. And just the idea of like constant rebirth and getting to, mm -hmm. you know, live again. That's just, it's really cool. Over and over. Yeah. Yeah. It's called when I was younger, I guess this is a little story talking about Harry Potter, but when I was younger, no matter what I dressed up as for Halloween, everyone would always just think I was Harry Potter. <laughs> like without, without a doubt, just, I would dress up in like soccer gear and stuff and I'd still be Harry Potter. Uh, to be fair, I did have like glasses and I was like kind of small and nerdy looking. But <laughs> without without a problem. It was always, oh look, it's a little Harry Potter. That that's it. <laughs> See that's when you just go, yes, I'm a hair I'm Harry Potter dressed as ha in for Halloween as a soccer player. Mm-hmm. Just give me candy. See, you just just gotta get the layers. <laughs> layers of costumes. The layers. There. <laughs> exactly awesome all right well um as i said at the beginning this is the last of our spooktober shows we'll be back to our normal uh or regular just kind of astronomy content uh starting next week um and since next week is somehow the beginning of november i still don't understand nope. how that's happened um 
we will be doing our, you know, what's up November sky. Um, so all of the astronomical events coming up in November. Uh, and then we'll also have our November constellation story time. But before we get to that, coming up on Saturday is our Halloween event at the planetarium, outside the planetarium this year. Um, so it's going to be similar in nature to the event we ran last year. Um, or we're going to have a drive through event where you can pick up a goodie bag full of fun activities you can do at home and, of course, candy. There will be awesome demonstrations that you can watch, and we'll be throwing pumpkins off the roof because, because we can, and it's fun, and it's totally legit because it's science, it's physics, right? You can pretend we're calculating the trajectory and the force that it hits the ground with. Yeah. Or we just chunk them and watch them go splat but um <laughs> you can find more information about that um in the event section of our facebook page um it has uh specific details the time frame um and then saturday morning um before the event we will be posting a map to kind of show where the drive through is going to be, where the pumpkin drop is going to happen, and where you can park for that. Um, so you can look for that being posted Saturday morning. Um, but yeah, uh, we hope to see a lot of you out there. We are making even more kits than we had last year, uh, since we ran out pretty quickly last year. Um, I think we were all very shocked um, at the, the amounts of support that we had. Um, very grateful, but also kind of kind of surprised um in good a good surprise. way yes a very yeah. good surprise <laughs> um so yeah we're, we're trying to be even more well prepared this year to have a lot more going on um all right well i think we'll wrap it up there thank you everyone so much for joining us we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week hopefully we will see you saturday Otherwise, uh, we'll catch you next week at our next stream because there, there's not going to be a stream Saturday because we're doing, you know, the, the drive through Halloween event. But all right. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye.